we are going on to um, four presentations which are examples of things that are being used in practice by farmers, particularly around greenhouse gas mitigation, but probably a little bit broader. So our first um, presenter is Marion de Vries from Wageningen, in, and she's going to give us an example in the Netherlands. She's a senior researcher um, at Wageningen uh, University in Research, and she focuses on um, improving the integral sustainability of dairy production systems uh, in particular, looking at aspects like greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity, and animal welfare. So over to you, Marion. And please, could you speak near the microphone for the benefit of the people online? We have yeah. quite a few people online, and um, the, the sound is much better if we are speaking near the microphone. Yeah, thank you, Frank, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. <coughs> uh, it's an honor to have the opportunity to talk about, uh, to give a talk about uh, what is being used in practice by Dutch uh, farmers on greenhouse gas mitigation. And indeed, I will focus on, uh, on dairy farming systems because this is the sector that has the largest contribution to total greenhouse gas uh, emissions in, in the Netherlands. Um, so to start with, uh, what are actually the climate targets? <laughs> climate targets uh, uh, for the Dutch dairy sector. Um, well, that is uh, related to the uh, national climate targets uh, that we have. And in 2019, um, the sectors, the main sectors in the Netherlands and the government uh, agreed in a national climate agreement uh, about the reduction that each sector in the Netherlands has, has uh, to fulfill. So uh, for the dairy sector, uh, they agreed to reduce uh, their emissions by 1.6 megatons of CO2 equivalents in uh, 2030 compared to 90, 1990. And that half of that uh, emission reduction would consist of methane, uh, that is both enteric methane and uh, methane from uh, manure. And then a, a smaller part from soils, so uh, uh, emissions uh, from soils, but also carbon sequestration and then uh, another part from uh, energy, so the re reduction of fossil energy use and renewable energy production. Also important is the national methane uh, strategy uh, that is more recent, eh, based on the methane pledge, the international methane pledge, and the ag agriculture in the Netherlands contributes about 75% to total methane emissions in the Netherlands, so, uh, and the mo uh, most of that is uh, caused by the, the dairy production. So uh, also there is an important role for, um, for the dairy sector to uh, reduce uh, methane emissions. But then at the same time, there's, um, besides the, the, uh, the governmental, uh, uh, the policy targets, there's also industry targets. And that is a bit a different approach because in industry, uh, the LCA approach is, uh, is taken, which was uh, explained also by Hayo. Um, um, so a bit a different approach, and what we see is that uh, the dairy processors um, on their own have their own targets for reducing greenhouse gas emissions in line with the pathway to one and a half uh, degrees, uh, the, the Paris Agreement. So for instance, for Friesland Campina, they have a target for 2030 to reduce 33% uh, uh, of the greenhouse gas emissions in their member dairy farms. <coughs> so um, greenhouse gas emissions are not the only challenge for uh, farmers. <laughs> in the Netherlands, there's many other uh, challenges that, uh, that farmers are facing. And there's, of course, you know, there's a big debate uh, about this uh, nitrogen, uh, water quality, biodiversity, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, uh, in the whole debate, there's uh, a an, an, uh, stressing uh, to say, well, the, uh, greenhouse gas emission reduction has to go hand in hand with all those other aspects that we have to uh, deal with, the other targets that we have. So we need an, really an integral approach, and we need to be also aware of uh, what uh, are the effects of certain measures on those different uh, uh, sustainability aspects. So looking uh, back in time, uh, since 1990, which is the reference year for uh, uh, the reduction of, uh, of emissions, um, we see that <coughs> there's a decreasing trend in the greenhouse gas emissions from the Dutch dairy sector. So this is based on the LCA approach. And in the 
blue bars, you see the total greenhouse gas emissions from the sector. Uh, and, um, and you see a reduction in total greenhouse gas emissions from the sector, despite an increase in total milk delivery. So that is the yellow line in this figure, uh, where you see an increase in milk delivery. So that decrease in total emissions was mainly caused by a decrease in the number of animals. And that was mainly due to the, uh, the milk quotum that was uh, still there at that time. Uh, and that caused a higher, uh, together with the higher productivity of animals, uh, the number of uh, dairy cattle were decreased in the Netherlands, uh, being the main factor for this uh, reduction in total emissions. Um, then in the black line, you see the emission intensity. And the emission intensity has, uh, so per kilogram of, uh, of milk, has decreased even stronger. So in this uh, article uh, from 2022, it was estimated that, it that the emission intensity reduced by 35% since uh, 1990. So well, if we look at that uh, achievement eh, from the past 30 years, well, uh, in terms of total emissions, the main cause was um, uh, the number of cattle, a reduction in the number of cattle. But uh, with regard to emission intensity, these are the most important factors, uh, efficiency eh, and productivity gains. That is um, uh, how the emission intensity was mainly influenced by increasing milk and roughage yields, uh, improving feeding efficiency and uh, lower nitrogen application. So uh, in the current situation, um, had there, there an, a, a further reduction has to take place in the Netherlands with regard to, uh, in the, for Dutch dairy farms with regard to greenhouse gas mitigation. And when we look at the drivers for change, yeah, for reducing greenhouse gas emission intensity on the dairy farms, uh, the main incentive at, at the moment are the milk premiums that are given by the dairy <coughs> processors. So that could be either based on, on uh, the milk carbon footprint, uh, oh. for instance, as is done by Friesland Campina and other dairy processors. Uh, and uh, and uh, there's also initiatives that are um, based, basing their milk premiums on uh, the number of mitigation measures that are implemented. So what you see that the main um, drivers are coming from the private sector, whereas actually the targets were mainly set by, by uh, policy. Um, then also from the private sector, another uh, uh, driver is uh, a very active communication and dissemination act activities by the uh, private uh, sector parties to, um, uh, for farmers to learn how to reduce uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And another um, driver is the participation of dairy farmers. There are many projects and many networks uh, in which farmers are learning how to uh, reduce emissions. Uh, for instance, uh, this project uh, that we have with more than 100 farmers with a target to reduce 30% uh, uh, of the methane from the farms. So what are the, the mitigation options, the greenhouse gas mitigation options that are currently considered in those such kind of uh, projects uh, by dairy farmers and that have a high technical le readiness level so uh, that they can al already be applied uh, in practice. Uh, well, here's a, sh a short list of, of some practices uh, which are very common uh, to reduce uh, the crude protein level in the, in the feed ration uh, uh, while increasing at the same time the energy level of the feed, low emission feed ingredients, both in terms of um, the footprint uh, during production, but also uh, in terms of the effect on methane emissions uh, from the animals, uh, reducing the young stock. Uh, nowadays, we're fr going from six uh, to five uh, young stock per 10 uh, dairy cattle. Uh, anaerobic uh, digestion is an, uh, an effective measure that is being considered. Uh, also, <coughs> increased uh, grazing or uh, fresh grass intake is uh, being uh, used in, in this um, by farmers. Uh, increasing the clover uh, in, in grassland or introducing the clover in grassland uh, as a way to also reduce synthetic fertilizer use by dairy farmers and reducing the use of uh, fossil energy and uh, renewable energy production. So that is what is used mainly in practice by uh, dairy farmers. And uh, like I said before, there's also uh, really an, an, uh, an important um, 
uh, awareness by farmers, but also in the projects that it has to be an integral approach, so that it's not only about uh, the effect on greenhouse gas emissions, but also ammonia, which is uh, quite important uh, nowadays. So then uh, also uh, many uh, mitigation options uh, that are um, potentially uh, effective are being tested in research and development. Some are further, already in a further stage of a technical readiness level, uh, such as uh, uh, feed additives like 3NOP or nitrates uh, that are already being used and piloted in projects on, on practical dairy farms, um, uh, various grazing strategies, uh, also, uh, genetic selection uh, is uh, something that will uh, soon uh, be, uh, become available uh, for farmers uh, to use to, to se select for uh, dairy, dairy cows with a lower uh, enteric methane um, by nature. And then by nurture, there's also uh, interest in the microbiome to influence the microbiome to reduce uh, uh, methane emissions. Um, with regard to uh, uh, manure solutions or from the stable, there are several solutions like methane oxidation, a biological or, or flaming of methane uh, from closed uh, manure storages, cooling the slurry, uh, and there's uh, solutions also uh, being looked at for, for soils to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from, from soils, especially for, for peatlands. Uh, there's a large, um, uh, much activity going on. Okay, so that was about practices that are being used uh, by dairy farmers to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or are still in development and might be uh, uh, used in, in the near future. Um, <clears throat> what is essential in, uh, in the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and, and uh, environmental performance is uh, uh, a high quality tool. And in the Netherlands, we are using the ANCA tool. In Dutch, it's called Kringloopwijzer. And ANCA, uh, the ANCA tool, is uh, mandatory for nearly all Dutch dairy farmers in the Netherlands. Um, uh, it is also supported uh, not only by the, by the government, but uh, especially also by the industry. So the industry has um, um, made it uh, obligatory for all, all dairy farmers, all their uh, suppliers to, to use uh, the, the ANCA tool. Initially, it was developed as a nutrient cycle, a nutrient cycling tool and later on, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, were added to this tool. Uh, so it, you could say it's really an uh, integral environmental uh, assessment tool for, for dairy farmers. And uh, I mentioned a few here, but there's also much more information in the, in the tool uh, that helps the farmer to manage his farms, to, to get a grip on what is, be, what is happening in the farm, but also with regard to uh, uh, other aspects like uh, the amount of homegrown protein or the, uh, the, the share of permanent grassland, uh, etc. So, um, so with regard to the quality, uh, the, the tool is based on uh, well, the most recent uh, uh, international guidelines like PEFCR uh, and other uh, international standards. Um, but also the quality of the input put data is, uh, is uh, uh, very important, uh, and that uh, uh, is, a, is a consideration for many tools, um, uh, how to guarantee that the input data uh, is, has a high quality, uh, is, is reliable. So in the Netherlands, uh, this has a lot of attention, and um, uh, actually this is organized by the sector, that automatically data is being collected uh, from several, uh, from dairy processors, from suppliers, uh, from uh, identification and registration systems. Um, so 95% of the data that is being used for this tool is, is coming uh, via automatic data collection. Um, and that, uh, well, to a, a large extent, guarantees that there's a high quality of the data uh, in, this, um, in this monitoring. Um, so, uh, there's, uh, this ANCA tool is very important for the Dutch dairy sector. It's also used for the financial rewarding, uh, like I just uh, mentioned, uh, for, uh, for instance, the dairy processors to reward on greenhouse gas emission reduction, but also other sustainability pro programs, uh, such as uh, local projects related to uh, biodiversity. So, what is uh, new? What we are now working on is to um, provide also additional tools. And those additional tools should help farmers, dairy farmers, to uh, simulate uh, what would happen if I would uh, implement a certain measure on my farm 
uh, how uh, could I reduce greenhouse gas emissions and other environmental impacts? So uh, we have uh, various, uh, of, or two tools actually that are uh, also, uh, one is already being used by dairy farmers in which a dairy farmer can indicate uh, a certain change in the farm and then uh, see the uh, farm specific uh, changes um, that are be to be expected. Uh, and we link this directly to the ANCA tool. So it is a very uh, uh, farm-specific uh, quantification of uh, the potential impacts of certain uh, measures that can be taken. So uh, you get, um, as a farmer, you get an output like this that you can see what is the impact of certain measures on, um, on greenhouse gas emission reduction in my own farm. Um, then a second uh, tool that we are working on currently with the dairy sector is uh, <clears throat> to develop a tool that um, a decision support tool that uh, also helps to have the integral sustainability uh, insight in integral sustainability. Um, like I mentioned, eh, the dairy farmer not only has to deal with environmental sustainability issues, but also with aspects um, of animal welfare, animal health. Uh, aspects that cannot be quantified. So besides these quantification tools, we are also developing uh, tools to have a really holistic um, view of um, the effects of measures on um, aspects of people, planets and profits um, with regard to potential trade-offs and uh, synergies of, of measures. Okay, so some take-home messages uh, to summarize. So what I showed is actually that we re with regard to uh, greenhouse gas emissions, we saw that already in the past uh, uh, a reduction has been achieved, that, but that has been mainly done through efficiency gains, yeah, productivity and efficiency gains in, in the Netherlands. Then towards the future, additional reduction is needed, and, and that will require additional uh, interventions, which are not necessarily uh, cost-effective <coughs> and might require other uh, strategies uh, by farmers. So there also financial uh, incentives will be, be um, getting a larger uh, role. Um, and there's a very, it's very important to have good uh, accounting tools, but also decision support tools, to, uh, the ex-ante uh, tools to, to calculate effects and, uh, of, of uh, measures. And it is important to take this integral approach uh, to make sure that we don't um, um, uh, progress on the greenhouse gas emissions, but not on other fields uh, of sustainability. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, uh, Frank, there was actually one more remark that I would like to make. Um, oh, now it's gone, but... I, we are in a Klien Farms uh, project, and on the Klien Farms website, uh, I don't know if you, yes, thank you. So uh, in this link uh, of the Klien Farms project, uh, you can find um, solutions, uh, climate solutions for agriculture uh, that has been um, uh, listed by this, this project. Um, well, and it is a nice uh, catalog of, um, of, of solutions, so that might be useful for you. The, um, the sustainability on your farms and in particular your, your dairy farms. So that was really good to get an overview of that. So now we're going to move on to um, uh, uh, farm, farmers from um, where's my thing from Switzerland, and uh, this is Antonia and Gabriel Ruckley. Uh, Antonia, sorry, you're you're presenting, I think, um, uh, Antonia. And you're going to give us an example of what you're doing on your pig farm in Switzerland to improve the sustainability. So um, Antonia and her brother Gabriel have just taken over the family farm about a year ago. And um, uh, we're going to be very interested to hear your story. You're also a postdoc in Agroscope looking at housing systems for, for pigs. So you have a, a leg in both camps, the farm and the lab. So over to you, um, Antonia. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's for us an honor to give you today an insight into our pig farm and to show you our view on sustainability. So now I also have to figure out the red one. This one? Ah, yeah. So our pig farm is located um, in the center of Switzerland, in the canton of Lucerne. 
we don't have a typical pig farm, as you can see here on the picture, because we used to have dairy cows until two, uh, 2003. And then we sold all our dairy cows, which was a bit sad, <laughs> I remember that time. But then we bought pigs, and nowadays we have 120 sows and 300 finishing places and 25 hectares of agricultural land. Who are we? So it's my brother and me. Um, we took over yeah, this year because uh, basically he's the son, but I'm the older one, <laughs> so we didn't agree with each other. No, basically, I mean, it gives freedom to both of us because uh, I can be here today and he's taking care of the pigs at home. Then our father, he is now employed by us. He's uh, working on the farm. Then we have um, Gregor. He used to be uh, an employer on our farm, but now he's working fully outside of the farm. But whenever we do reconstructions on the farm, he's helping us with the yeah, constructions. And then our mother, she's working as a self-employed physiotherapist, so she, she's also working outside of the farm, but um, she supports us whenever we need help. So I would like to talk today about two innovations on our, our farm. Um, why innovations? So actually we got, to know, or we got the ideas of these new farming systems during our studies at different universities um, across Europe, and we decided to try to implement them in practice. So let me start with uh, the intermittent suckling. Actually the idea, we got them during my master um, abroad at Wageningen University. So intermittent suckling means, means actually that sows and piglets are separated for a certain time during the day. Um, you might question yourself, why would you do that? But let me start with the, the natural behavior of pigs. So when we look at what or with which age actually uh, piglets would wean, we talk about 16 to 20 weeks of age, and the whole weaning process would be actually gradual. But when we look at practice, um, we are talking about four weeks of lactation in, um, in IP Swiss, which is a label in Switzerland, and we talk about six weeks of uh, lactation in Bio Swiss, which is the organic label. And weaning is still very abrupt, so it's from one day to the other. And this is actually the time that a lot of health problems can occur, like diarrhea or um, piglets even um, dying. And what was found out that actually with this intermittent suckling, um, a lactational estrus can be induced, so that actually sows can be inseminated during lactation, so that in the end you can have a longer lactation, but similar reproduction numbers as you would have if you would wean the piglets with four weeks of age. So we said, let's try to implement that on our farm. And I would like to present you now how we implemented this intermittent suckling on our farm. So we have one large group with pregnant sows, around 80 sows in one group. And when they are about to farrow, we move them to a free farrowing system and we keep them there until the piglets are three weeks old. And then we move them to a group housing system, always three to four sows together with their litters. And when the piglets are four weeks old, we start with this intermittent suckling. You can imagine it like a, a kindergarten system. So in the morning, the sows are already ready at the gates. We open the gates, doors. They are running to the place where they meet the boar. The piglets stay in the, in the group housing systems and the sows stay with the boar for 10 to 12 hours. In the evening, we open the gates at the insemination area. The sows are going back to the piglets and they meet again. And when we do that for five to seven days in a row, we can actually inseminate the sows um, in the end of this intermittent suckling. And that's when we keep the sows and the piglets together again until the piglets are eight weeks old. So what does it mean now, like if, you, if we compare our system with the systems that you, can find, that you can find in Switzerland? So we have now eight weeks of lactation compared to, for example, in uh, IP Swiss or QM Schweizer Fleisch, where piglets are weaned with four weeks. In uh, Bio, I already said it's six weeks. However, we have the similar reproduction numbers as QM Schweizer Fleisch and IP Swiss. 
So this was it quite quickly about this, the first innovation. So I would like to move on to this total mixed ration feeding for pregnant sows. Um, so I would also like to start with the normal behavior of pigs because when we observe pigs in nature, they would spend actually 23% um, with exploring and searching for food. Then they would also spend 31% with grazing. And I brought you a video here. I've, I don't know if you've ever seen a sow grazing. It's from our farm at home because we also have a little pasture because it's very impressive for me to see how sows are actually grazing. Unfortunately, you can't see, you can't hear the sound, but it's, I, I could watch that many, many times. So yeah, and then actually they would spend 21% with digging in the soil and basically only 25% of the daily activities dedicated to social contact and valuing and so on. So like 75% is actually dedicated to feed. And here is a picture from our farm, how we kept the, the sows before we changed to the new feeding system. So we had this ele electric sow feeding system where they had to feed alone and where they could only feed like for a, sh for a short time during the day. And also one discussion that we often had on our farm was the homegrown protein source because our farm is on 800 meters of above sea level and we have 1,300 millimeters of rain per year. So it's not yet possible to grow soy for us. Um, but we are in Switzerland and we are actually grassland, so we were questioning ourselves, why can't we use just a grass clover mix to feed our pigs? Moreover, because actually this grass clover mix also has a benefit in terms of resilience, because basically if hail, for example, occurs, it happened already two years, um, all our crops were destroyed, but the grass clover mix um, can, grow again, can grow again. So. We decided to um, calculate uh, uh, a feed ratio for our pregnant sows, which consists now of 48% um, of silage, then 18% of hay, and then 32% uh, of compound feed. And we add some minerals and vitamins. And you can actually see in the picture how it looks. It's actually quite similar to the feed that you can find in dairy cows. And that's how it looks now in practice. So we put racks where we feed the sows every morning, new TMR feeding, uh, TMR uh, mix ration, and they can feed throughout the whole day and all together. And now here you can see again like our farm system compared to the labels that you can find in Switzerland. So in QM Schweizer Fleisch and IP Swiss, it's not mandatory to feed roughage, however, also farms are feeding roughage because roughage, we know that it's beneficial for the pigs. In, in organic farming, it's mandatory to feed part of roughage, but as you can see on our farm, the pregnant sows get um, um, uh, the biggest ratio um, from roughage. Now, let me finish with how our systems contribute to a sustainable pig farming. So first of all, animal welfare is becoming more and more important when we talk about sustainability and actually these systems take the natural behavior of pigs more into account. But they are also beneficial for our economical performance because we were able to um, reduce 30% of our feed costs in the pregnant cells and also we were able to reduce the costs for, vet for um, antibiotics and other veterinary costs. When we talk about the environment, they are beneficial because um, yeah, we were able to re uh, replace part of the compound feed with a homegrown uh, clover grass mixture, and we were able to reduce the antibiotics. And since we are now growing grass clover mix, we were also able to improve our crop rotation on the farm. And last but not least, happy pigs, happy farmers. So <laughs> we are very happy with the systems because Somehow it's again like very challenging to yeah, work together with, this, with the sows in these systems. In that sense, I would like to thank you for your attention. Yeah, and um, feel free to contact us. We also have Facebook and Instagram where we update about our daily life on the farm.
very much, Antonio. That was fascinating. We have one minute maybe for one question, if anybody has a question. It was really um, interesting. I have 20 questions myself, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Yeah, it's yeah, it's mandatory. I know, but it's to that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, in Switzerland it is. But do you think the diet has helped with with that? You know, with with having no problems because you say you had reduced your veterinary costs. I presume then you don't have this issue of tail bite, biting. D does the diet help? Do you think? I mean, this. Um. So the TMR feeding, we feed in, we feed it to our pregnant cells. We don't feed it yet to our finishers. However, however our finishers are kept like on, on, on a straw bedding and they have an outer run. But yeah, this is the next step that we would like also to implement this TMR feeding in the finishing place uh, for the finishers because yes, we know that roughage actually is part of their diet and it can help to reduce the, the tail biting. On our farm, like we don't have these pens that like all the pigs have tail biting. Sometimes it can happen that we have like one pig who, that starts to bite and then we have to find out this pig and when we remove it, like it's calm again in the pen. Yeah. Okay, listen, thank you very much and uh, I'm sure lots of people will have lots of questions at lunchtime for you also. So thank you very much thank again, you. Antonio. So our next spe <coughs> speaker um, is Gregor Brodziak and Gregor um, is, is involved or running the Good Valley Poland uh, company since 1994. It's a large scale, fully integrated agricultural company that he co created. Um, look, he's many other strings to his bow, uh, many degrees, but uh, just this year he's completed postgraduate studies in agriculture and ecology at Warsaw University of, of Animal Science, and you're an expert in strategic management, policy, and law in the area of agriculture. So you're going to give us an example of what's happening in um, the Good Valley uh, Company in Poland. So looking forward to hearing you, Gregor. Thank you, thank you for the introduction and uh, the pleasure to be with you. And I would like to share a story which is a bit different uh, from Antonia's story, uh, representing a, a large scale production in a full value chain. And normally I would, I would use one and a half hour to tell the story, so I need to be very concise today. Uh, so please, please have a look. Um, we, we come from the Scandinavian standard, uh, as Harold mentioned, uh, we need to be site-specific when we talk about agriculture and see the full picture and see the context uh, which uh, is adjusted and fits to the local environment. So that's what we tried to do in Poland back in the 90s, the beginning of the 90s, when we took over the old state-run farms in Poland, which were basically abandoned and, and devastated. So we, we decided as Danish farmers to re-establish and rebuild production, but according to new sustainable, we call them today standards. But at that time, it was, it was rather logic, rationality, and, and attitude, good attitude to environment. Then it turned out to, to get a good words as names for these actions. But let me give you the outline of what we do. Uh, we are quite large, and we are based in Poland as the second uh, biggest large producer, large producer, big producer also present in Ukraine, luckily in a safe position today, just short comment. We have a turnover of more than 100 million per, per year. We employ more than 1,000 people uh, spread in an area of Pomerania in Poland, and we have 12,000 hectares uh, which we grow, again spread over a large, uh, large area with uh, 25 farms and other service units which we contain in our company, again building up this circular model. Uh, we have in total 22,000 sows in three site systems, so it, it's full production cycle uh, divided into, into 25 units. And also we uh, started back in 2005 to build biogas plants which utilize uh, much of our manure and also some other biomass uh, delivering energy like electricity and heat to our farms and also outside. Uh, as the important part of our full value chain, we have a slaughterhouse and processing uh, of, of the meat uh, with direct contact to consumers or at least the retail chains, which also closes the circle. Let me mention that uh, an important part of our circular approach is that we are quite uh, 
compact in our way of operating. So the radius which we have uh, in crucial distances is around, uh, it's not more than 200 kilometers from our feed production, for example, to the furthest farm, which reduces the transport needs and also it's good for animal welfare uh, and all the functions which we need for daily operation uh, are very close nearby. Uh, the full value chain which we have been trying to build up during those years includes both crop production on these 12,000 hectares of land, our own feed uh, mill producing all the feed we need for our pigs so we exactly know what we put in, in the feed and how, how we balance the diets. We raise our pigs in our farms, we have the biogas plants producing energy, we have slaughtering, cutting, deboning, processing and uh, consumer uh, in, the, in the end. Uh, one of the most important uh, things uh, in the start of the cycle is, of course, it's soil, it's crop production. Uh, all about, about precise agriculture, about the digital solutions, uh, monitoring of yields, monitoring of, of, of fields, uh, and uh, sp site-specific production, variable rate of application. These are the things we all know about, and which refer to soil, and together with what we call regenerative practices, uh, start the good approach to what we call sustainable agriculture, uh, uh, then again looked upon as a holistic approach. What we do is, uh, of course, trying to keep the fields covered with plants most of the year. Now we are aiming at 80%. Uh, we have the right crop uh, rotation as far as possible on our poor soils. We, we work on very poor soils, must say, but very sandy. Uh, and then the aim is, of course, to have this good tilt, uh, tilt the good drainage in, in, the, in, the, in the soil, microorganisms, nutrients, and lower wheat pressure. Uh, a lot of have been, has been told uh, about feed today, so just let me mention that, of course, having this possibility to, uh, to make our diets ourselves, we do it due to the nutrient, due to the balance, due to the cost, uh, in order to be as sustainable as possible, but also to avoid and reduce waste, which then contributes to higher uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Picture of our farm, one of our farms. Uh, this one used to be state-run. We took it over back in 2010. Uh, and this specific farm uh, uh, includes uh, 5,000 sows and 19 uh, uh, places for weaners. Uh, this one is uh, specifically, we decided to run and to start rebuilding it as a free farrowing pen uh, farm. So we have 5,000 sows uh, producing in free farrowing pens. I will show you a picture later. Uh, but also, a farm like this, like most of the farms, includes both the biogas plant and the land around, allowing to, in a responsible way, use the manure, and in this specific situation, the digested from the biogas plant. Uh, the animal welfare has been touched today. Let me just mention that we have been trying and we are implementing many of the things which are under discussion now, starting with these free farrowing, farrowing pens. Uh, by the way, the negoti negotiated proposal is now on the level of 6.5 meters up to 7.5 meters per, uh, per pen, where we have invested in 5.5, which is two meters, square meters more than standard. So the question is how uh, the front runners will be uh, treated with the new legislation and the new standards. What, what kind of time of transformation would be allowed for those? Uh, another uh, question of uh, reduced antimicrobials, of course, is connected very much to the whole picture again, the holistic approach to the health of the pigs, uh, starting from the genetics uh, through uh, through the facilities you have and the climate in the, in the, in the barns and the management and the feed. Uh, we're, tr we're trying to, to reduce. We tried to run a test with no antibiotics at all for some years. It didn't work too well uh, in, in the global consumption of antibiotics, so we changed to go over to reduction overall, and we have been succeeded, succeeding uh, reducing it by 10 to 15 percent. Tail docking is a challenge. I will not uh, elaborate on that. Uh, but uh, immunocastration, it's also a topic where we have been trying to, to, use, uh, to use it for 10 years now with success, and I think uh, that will be one of the directions in the new legislation. Manipulation, material, and foraging behavior, uh, clear things connected to animal welfare. We, we use wood uh, in, in our case. 
as the, the best material we have uh, experienced. Transport of animals, under discussion, in our case, we have limited it to three hours maximum. Uh, different uh, proposals are discussed in the EU right now. Monitoring of slaughterhouses, we take the last part of the chain. Uh, we also introduced it voluntarily uh, some years ago, uh, just in order to be transparent again. Uh, I will touch the question of uh, uh, consumers and the civil society in the last part. Uh, if we just uh, go back uh, to this farrowing pen, as mentioned, 5.5 meters uh, as opposed to 3.5 as uh, conventional standard today. Uh, we have noticed that uh, the production results are good. We, uh, we have uh, parameters like uh, uh, 18 uh, live born per, uh, 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 per sow. Uh, we have weaning weights after 28 days like 6.5 uh, kilograms. And we have a uh, number of weaned per sow per year, like uh, 35 today. So quite good results. Again, back to the discussion about efficiency and sustainability uh, calculated per kilogram of product in the end, or more holistic approach uh, with indirect impacts. But uh, efficiency, we believe, is uh, one of the good ways to, in order to achieve higher sustainability standards. We've been uh, front runners, so since 2014, we have been using this uh, uh, production model, uh, uh, representing about 25% of our production, and now waiting for the new standards to come in order to, uh, to make a plan for uh, transformation in our, all, uh, all our units. Because the question of employees is very crucial. It starts and it ends uh, uh, very much with the employees and their attitudes. So we have a, a, a very advanced program of uh, training people and shaping the attitudes uh, so they, in the end, understand and put into practice things which we think are, are good to do. One important example and part of our sustainability is the biogas plants. We started back in 1999 to discuss biogas plants based on the Danish experience again. First, in 2005, we managed to build the first biogas plant, which was the first biogas plant in Poland, and then it started to develop slowly. It's not enough, uh, in general, you might say, in Poland, but uh, there is development on the way. What we have achieved, uh, apart from uh, cap capturing, cap catching, um, uh, capturing methane uh, uh, from uh, pig manure, uh, because compared to, to ruminants, we do not have this big challenge about the two holes which are hardly manageable in cows. In pig production, we can, we can easy, more easily manage uh, the manure flow in tight conditions with pipes and, and tight buildings. Uh, so uh, apart from that, we have, of course, been, been able to cover 100% of our electricity consumption in the agri part and 70% of, of the heat consumption. Uh, we closed down all the coal run uh, uh, facilities back in the 90s already, uh, went over to gas and oil, but then gradually over to, to biogas plant and uh, cogeneration. So uh, a, a huge advantage also in terms of what would we call resilience in the time of crisis. If we think back uh, to the outbreak of the war in Ukraine and the prices of electricity and, and heat, we were very happy indeed to have our own sources, not only price-wise, but also security-wise. Uh, what we have been doing in order to quantify our uh, sustainability and climate impact, we started already in 2007 to measure our emissions and reductions. But since 2012, we have been calculating our carbon footprint, uh, including, of course, scope three, which represents 90% of all the emissions in our case. This is normal for most of the activities in agriculture. Uh, and we, what we noticed uh, is that we were on the level of 2.4 kilograms CO2 per kilo meat in the end, which is at least 50% lower than the benchmark in the industry. Uh, whereas from this year, we start to calculate LCA, life cycle of assessment, uh, for chosen products in order to communicate again to the consumers what we do, where we are. Very important uh, part of our chain is also uh, natural uh, manure, natural fertilizer. Uh, much of it comes from our biogas plants as digested, and it covers uh, about 70% of our needs for nitrogen, which is also very nice, 
and we like it in the times of high uh, fertilizer prices. So it's a part, of, of course, of the circular agriculture. And going back to the, to the last uh, part of our chain, it's uh, slaughtering and uh, processing. As you see, we, we slaughter all our pigs, and it's only our pigs, so we keep the standard. We know where they come from, where they come from, what standard they have, and also the biosecurity uh, aspect and issue, especially in Poland, where we have been uh, coping with ISF for now almost 10 years. Uh, but we keep safe. Our farms uh, have not been affected, and we are known as one of the highest standards as to biosecurity in Poland, showing also the example uh, to other producers. Just some examples of our products, in order to tell you that the dialogue with the consumers is so important, as we know, uh, in the discussion about diets and uh, going vegetarian or vegan or any other direction. We, uh, we communicate that we have products made 100% meat, no additives, no conservatives, due to our short production chain, so we can keep uh, high hygiene. We also use recycled packaging, and we try also to adjust uh, our production our, and our proposal to the new needs, even including some plant-based uh, sausages, which have, we have been testing. Uh, a challenge, but uh, we, we try to test. What is very important is to, to tell what we do, how we do. So as the first ones in Poland, at least, we started two years ago to put QR code on our products where you can go in and, and see the whole story and the value chain, the location, and how we do things. Uh, I think it's so important to, to be in dialogue with the consumers, with the stakeholders, in order to, for everybody to understand what agriculture is about and where the products come from, how they're produced. So, yeah, the discussion we have, what we uh, promote in, in our communication to the stakeholders is that we should go like flexitarian. We, we have potential to reduce meat consumption in Europe, in US, some other parts of the world. So let's eat less, but better meat. Choose responsibly. That's our message in our communication. Of course, from that, just to mention from that, and getting very good feedback about you have a good story, you have a nice uh, setup to a margin on product, a higher margin on product, there is a long way. And we haven't been able to increase our margins yet, but uh, we need to start somewhere. Uh, the, last, uh, the last remark is about the, uh, uh, the so important pillar in the ESG and the whole sustainable concept, so social part of it, uh, and not only supporting the local activities and getting involved in these things, being open, transparent, but also exactly being in the dialogue with the consumers and, and telling and showing and explaining how, how you produce things. So that's uh, very shortly our story. And let me just uh, conclude with the, uh, with the thing we already have been discussing and I have heard also in Lyon this year, that in order to achieve the ambition, ambi very ambitious goals we have within the European Green Deal, we not only need to go into this green transformation agroecology, agri but also reduce food waste and change our consumption paradigms, because these things together, three things together, can give us a chance to, to change our world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gregor, and again, a fascinating account of, of what you have done over the last uh, almost 30 years, I guess, in building uh, a very integrated and sustainable uh, business. Again, we'll just take one question if, if, if anybody has a question. Okay, I'm going to ask you the hard one. So, how do you, like, your fantastic work on, on welfare done, fantastic work on traceability, on, on reducing your energy use. The, the one chink in your ar armor, maybe, or your Achilles heel, is the food feed competition. How do you minimize that, or how, what's your view on, on that? As a yeah, this is a, this is a challenge, and uh, 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 even in the case of our biogas production, we, we have uh, quite a lot of uh, maize silage we use in this process, uh, and we tr we're trying to ch exchange it with straw, going to the second generation uh, uh, raw material. The, Something with defense of this concept is that we operate on the very poor soils, as mentioned. Uh, so apart from, some, from maize, nothing else would be kind of efficient production, uh, crop production on this kind of soil. So this kind of defense, this concept, and uh, you know, we, we do it. Uh, but in the end, we need to, to shift to, to second generation. And one more thing is the soy, which was mentioned before also. 
We tried 10 years ago to crop soil, uh, to grow soil on our land without success, but now we are getting another attempt, uh, trying to take another attempt because the climate is changing, so we need to utilize at least what, what is coming here, and also the, uh, the uh, technologies are better, so that's, that's what we would try to do. Okay, well look, thank you with that, and best luck for, for continued success in, in, your, um, in, in your operation. Thank you. So, our next speaker, um, is have we got her? Our next speaker is Catherine Schoberger from CJA. There you are, Catherine. How are you? And um, Catherine is going to talk on the challenges of young farmers entering livestock farming. And you're not the only young farmer here today. We we had just our second last speaker was also a young farmer just as recently entered pig pig farming. But anyway, um, your your age is here. I'm not going to call it out, but we can see you're you're quite quite young. Uh, you work at a rural education institute in Vienna while residing on a farm in Upper Austria. And um, you know, you have a lot of hands-on work on, on the family farm, uh, and you're interested in organic agricultural systems and have pursued studies in that, and you've completed a master, you're com currently completing a master's on the potential effects of probiotics on the behavior, health, and productivity of piglets. So anyway, you're currently one of the vice presidents of CJA, which is the European Council of Young Farmers, and you're going to talk to us about the challenges for young people who are considering entering farming. So over to you, Catherine. So, <clears throat> so thank you already for this uh, comprehensive introduction. Um, and I think the topic of sustainable livestock is uh, a very crucial one. Um, and I'm glad we also had some good examples, especially from pig farming, because what often um, is the case in Austria, I come from Austria, um, is that mostly grassland-based um, dairy cows are the, the parade example for a sustainable agriculture, so I'm glad uh, all the, all, uh, also pigs are included in that. Um, after this uh, good examples, best practice examples, I would now go back uh, to the challenges that young farmers face um, when they are before this, um, this decision, decision to take if they want to start farming and yeah, how they want to um, design their farm. So as I already mentioned, I'm a young farmer myself, um, yet I have also uh, many other roles, um, and uh, usually I start introducing myself according to the context and the audience, but as we speak about challenges, um, I would like to also mention um, that I'm um, also a student, a project manager, and CJA vice president, so it's a lot in one uh, pot currently. Um, who is CJA actually, for the ones that don't know us? Um, we are the European Council of Young Farmers. We are representing 24 uh, members, um, 22 um, European member states, and also two associate members from the UK and Serbia. And across Europe, we speak with the voice of two million young farmers, um, so the next farming generation, and we aim to promote um, a younger and more inno innovative agricultural sector and also creating good working and living conditions for young people. Because to date, only 6.5% uh, of all farmers are below the age of 35. And this is quite concerning, um, because we actually need young farmers to ensure high quality food, maintain rural areas, but also to contribute to the object objectives of the European Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy. Um, and what I'm doing on the farm now, I'm, I live and uh, work there together with my husband. It is still um, the farm of his parents. They specialize in uh, pig breeding. Um, and the animal feed we produce on the, um, also most on our farm, uh, except for actually soy and protein feed. Um, and when we think about the farm transmission that will be coming in a few years, um, there are many things that go through our minds, but most importantly, we need to actively decide where we see ourselves in the future, where we want to, um, yeah, how we want to uh, create our future, and if this future even lies within agriculture. So from my current point of view, I'm very much attached to the farm and to agriculture, and I uh, really look forward to managing it together with my husband, but it also comes with uh, several concerns. Um, so what could facilitate uh, making this decision for me and also for many other young people that are willing to set up um, a farm? <clears throat> um, 
when taking this decision, we are confronted by um, already a difficult access to the sector and entrepreneurship. And this comes with uh, many different reasons. And at CISA, we see that mostly these uh, reasons or obstacles are the same across all European member states. And I would like to start uh, with the access to land as a first challenge, um, because it's the basis of, for our production. Um, one might say that private property is governed by the national laws of member state, but we certainly think that it's also of highest relevance for the European level. And <clears throat> what we observe is, uh, as an obstacle to access land is, uh, first of all, the low availability of land. Uh, on the one hand, because of land abandonment, because we have a very low number of young farmers, but also due to the high competition um, that is on there on agricultural soils. Um, yeah, soil has many functions. I do not need to say that. Also, the um, interest in offsetting emissions is rising, so al also other sectors are very interested. Um, this competition also leads to increasing prices of land, both for renting and buying land, uh, which is especially dif difficult at the beginning when you want to set up a farm. Um, another point is also the intergenerational land mobility, so um, transmitting farms. Um, uh, this can happen because of um, retired farmers that uh, do not want to um, hand over the farms to the younger generation, they are not encouraging enough, um, or also non-active farmers. Um, what we also criticize about land and soil is uh, the lack of data and transparency in land planning and ownership, which is, seems to be not very clear. And this is why we would also like to see uh, instruments for a better preservation of agricultural land, so really um, um, setting goals on how soil should be used and what uh, its primary functions should be. We also recommend having a better definition of the active farmer um, in order that uh, cap payments really go to the farmers that actually farm. Um, yeah, the second challenge would be uh, access to investment um, because young farmers are actually more likely to see their loan applications rejected uh, compared to farmers below um, above the age of 40. And this is because young farmers are perceived as a risky investment uh, because they are new to the sector and uh, their lack of capital in the beginning. So what we need here are financial instruments um, to support investment in the beginning. Um, what we would also need is a reflection together with banks and private stakeholders about the future of um, sustainable agricultural investment and how this support can look like. And I think this is also very much um, linked to the perception of the sector because livestock sector is um, often in the public debate perceived very negatively. Um, and this um, also impacts then the, um, so where banks grant loans, they would not uh, grant loans if the perception of the livestock sector is very negative. Um, so this is, uh, very critical for us. Um, investment also is linked to um, call, uh, like a fair income of farmers. Um, this is still a very big issue and also a fair, fair uh, position in the food chain um, because we see that farmers have limited bargaining power and in too many cases, retailers condition farmers to sell below their actual production costs. So what we uh, recommend is that prices need to be built um, from the farm to the consumers and have to be actually based on agricultural production costs. Um, financing also um, is linked to financing as a sustainable transition that is needed to adapt and mitigate climate change. Um, because we see the impact of climate change on farming, uh, it's uh, very obvious. Um, and here we need uh, the necessary tools, guidance, education, um, investment support to, in order to make this transition. Um, in order to make this transition, we also need um, like good education systems, um, good advisory systems um, that, um, that enable um, also looking for new ways in farming. 
Um, I already mentioned at the beginning that farming is um, a very um, diverse profession, and as the profession itself is diverse already, um, also, uh, what we also need to consider is the diversity of EU farming systems. So there is no one-size-fits-all approach that will help, that will succeed um, sustainability, but we need to embrace this diversity and also see it as an advantage. Um, what is, uh, yeah, farming is also linked to the rural areas, and here we, um, we need to, yeah, prevent um, rural areas from being depopulated by ensuring good living and working conditions. Um, working and living in rural areas can sometimes be isolating for people that probably uh, are not used to it. Um, and CISA also has recently investigated this topic um, by participating in a project about mental health for young farmers to raise awareness also on the mental health issue. <clears throat> Um, and uh, one challenge that is uh, also linked to the livestock sector is, uh, for me, especially the long-term certainty. We have a, lo a lot of um, new legislations coming up now, um, new requests by society, but what is still missing is like the long-term certainty on where we can invest, what will also be guaranteed uh, within the next 30, 40 years. Um, this is a really high challenge because um, investments and especially livestock is only long-term, there are no short-term decisions. Um, yeah, so in general, I would say it is up to all of us to work on the vision um, of uh, farming. We have to recognize the challenges that are there and to address them in, a, in an appropriate way. And we think that this requires uh, much of a dialogue a dialogue that is enabling for the younger generation in committing for a more sustainable and resilient farming sector, um, where we have skilled workforce, where we are able to face climate change, where we are um, we're able to face market fluctuations, where we solve access to land, low income, and investment support. And also European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen mentioned in her speech of the Union this year, it's about also making the business easier and more accessible. And uh, yeah, with that, I hope we have also a good um, dialogue in the next session. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Katharina. If you want to just wait for, we will maybe just take one question from the floor at this stage, if, if there is one. You're all very quiet. Any questions in the chat? It was a lot of points as well. Well, I think you made some very important points. And um, okay, Jean-Louis. So Jean-Louis Perrault from INRA, past president of Animal Task Force. Uh, very interesting presentation. I have a, a question about investment. Uh, you mentioned just at the last part of your talk. Uh, I think it's a, really a crucial issue uh, because we are thinking about the long term, notably for animal housing, mm -hmm. and how farmers can take decision on this aspect uh, in, a, in a world where we change leg legislation quite often. And, and it is really a, a key point, and I wonder how we can tackle this point from a, a researcher point of view. Um, yeah, so here we need a very concrete solution for investment. I mean, we have uh, financial support within the common agricultural policy, where there's also investment support. Um, this is already a good support, um, but it's uh, only for uh, setting up a new farm. So it's... Uh, so it doesn't include, uh, for example, like long, longer term investment. It's really just at the start. Um, yeah, so we, uh, so the financing of the cap is very crucial for young farmers. Yes, or, well. Okay, but the in investment can be quite different according to the system we choose just before we, we saw two uh, ways to produce pig, and the investment are totally different in the two kinds of systems. So we can also choose the system according to the, 
to the risk we, we admit in terms of investment. There okay, is, so it's, it's, so it's about... There is a lot of debate about so-called intensive dairy farming versus grassland-based dairy farming, mm. for example. Mm. So if I understand it correctly, I think we need also to talk about uh, risk sharing and risk management for investment. And here we could imagine that also risk is much more, because right now it's much on, it's everything on the shoulders of the farmer. So it could also be distributed risk sharing more along the value chain and other agricultural actors. Okay. Thanks for the <laughs> reformulation. Okay, thank you very much, Katarina. Um, we will move on to the next session of our, of our seminar now. I will just move over to the podium. So we're going to a panel discussion, and um, if I could ask some of our speakers to, to join us here on the, the podium. Um, again, that's Jean-Louis Perrault, um, uh, Hugo and Harland. If you could join us here, please. And Hugo, or Heo, sorry, Heo, fantastic. apologies. And uh, to our, our um, just take a seat, Wolfgang. We are very pleased to be joined uh, by Wolfgang Bertzler and Humberto Delgado. Please, please take a seat. So, so I will... In I will introduce our, our two new arrivals. So Wolfgang Bertzler, uh, here beside me, has been Director General of DG Agri since 2020. And before that, um, he was Deputy Director General of DG Research and Innovation with responsibility for agriculture, food and health and, and, and other matters. Um, and beside him, we have Humberto Delgado, who is Director for Biodiversity in DG Environment. And previously, um, he was in the Director for Mainstreaming Adaptation and Low Carbon Technology in DG Climate Action. So he's a lot of experience in European and international um, environmental policy, particularly in the areas of biodiversity and climate change issues. So um, I will give uh, the floor for a few minutes to Wolfgang and Umberto, but be before I do that, I might summarize uh, what we have heard here this morning for, for your benefit. Um, now, this will be a very rough summary, so I'm sure I will forget uh, lots of very important things. So we started with um, a recap on the uh, symposium that we had at the European Association of Animal Production Conference in Lyon um, by Jean-Louis Perrault, around the t and, th and that was around the topic of sustainability and wh wh what does it mean in terms of livestock systems. And uh, Jean-Louis gave us a, a very good um, uh, summary of that, and uh, the, if I could find it, yes, um, the, the key points that I took away from that is that livestock systems are complex, and the challenge of assessing them is therefore very complex. Uh, secondly, there are many ways to reach a good outcome. You know, there is not a, a, a single pathway that will deliver us to the promised land of sustainable livestock systems. And that theme comes up later on in several of our presentations uh, this morning as well, that there are, there are many ways in which we can make progress. And the, the third um, point, which really follows on from that, is that if both, both efficiency and circularity and diversity are important components of making livestock systems more sustainable. So it's not just one or the other, um, all of those uh, efficiency, circularity and diversity have big, big contributions to make. So we then had a, a presentation from Claire Burry from DG Sante, who brought us up to speed on where the, the, the implementation and thinking is with the, uh, the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy. And I suppose, you know, some of the, the, the key remarks that Claire made were that, um, you know, the, the same objectives really remain with the Green Deal. Certainly, food security has come back on the agenda. There's been a lot of big political changes since the, the Farm to Fork strategy was, was launched. Um, but the same objectives remain, and, and doing nothing is not an option uh, in terms of Im improving the sustainability of our systems. And she also made the point that changing and making our systems more sustainable actually in, include, improves the resilience of the agri-food chain. 
So there's a big agenda, obviously, in, in DG um, Sante around uh, issues to do with the livestock sector. And Claire outlined to us the, the, um, the, the work that's going on in, in relation to animal welfare, um, health surveillance and antimicrobial resistance and, and lots of other things. Obviously, the framework law on sustainable food systems is still a work in progress. So, so a lot going on on, on the policy side. Um, we then went into a number of talks that looked at how we try to measure um, or quantify sustainability. And life cycle assessment, you know, is a tool that's very, very widely used uh, mm -hmm. to do that, both by, by industry and by policymakers and, and government. So, you know, we had a, a very good presentation from, from HEO on, on that. And certainly uh, life cycle assessment is very important, but it has its, its limitations. And... Um, you know, because it is singular, it looks at one one particular output, such as greenhouse gas emissions. So the the recommendations were that as you know, we should combine life cycle assessments with uh, ecosystem services assessments, and that we need to assess things like land uh, degradation and biodiversity and pesticide use, um, and that we we need also to not just look at um, expressing the the or use the metrics of per quantity of food that we also need to express the impacts per unit area and i suppose uh, very much quest uh, heo questioned the um the the usefulness of life cycle assessment um measuring the impact per kilo of product for extensive systems that are also delivering a lot of other ecosystem services so you know life cycle assessments while they have their value they certainly have their limitations we had a, a, a very interesting presentation from Norway and Sweden um, uh, on some work that is going on there um, and looking at their agricultural system. And I suppose a, a key um, finding or a key uh, piece of analysis that was done in that was what, what would happen to food security and self-sufficiency uh, if they removed livestock totally from the um, production system and concentrated just on plant production. And the findings from the, the study, I, I think it refers to Norway, I'm not sure was it both Norway and Sweden, just Norway, that self-sufficiency would decrease by from 50% currently to 14% if animals were taking, taken out of the, the system. And, and that obviously has to do with the, the, the circularity and the, the, the benefits that livestock uh, give as part of a, an overall food system. So anyway, that, that obviously would be a, a very um, uh, huge impact on, on self-sufficiency in Norway, and, and it shows the, the, the importance of, of keeping livestock as part of a sustainable food system. Uh, we then had two quick presentations from Lauren Smith and David uh, Kenny, uh, who are the coordinators of the Pathways Project, um, which is, I think, a very important project that's about halfway through its, its, its work, um, which is looking at pathways for sustainable livestock production within Europe and um, how, how, can we, how can we characterize, I suppose, or define what might be the best pathway uh, for, for the future. So, um, and David Kenny's project, Step Up, is due to start um, on the 1st of, of January and... Um, that again is looking at how we how we can best uh, characterize and assess our our livestock systems in terms of their sustainability. And indeed, uh, Wolfgang, you got an honourable mention uh, in relation to that because you have been calling for a number of years for better information for policymakers around the sustainability of of livestock systems, or their 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 their, their, their impacts, positive and negative, and step up is is answering that. So look, that was our kind of first session, and I suppose to, to summarize it, it really was saying that um, sustainability is, our livestock systems are complex, and assessing them is, is quite complex, and sim simple or singular evaluations are, are really inadequate. Um, so we had lots of suggestions as to how they can be improved, and there's lots of research going on around that and uh, to better understand the, the role of livestock and to be better able to assess it. But we very much recognize that um, policymakers can't wait for all that research because you're making policy today and tomorrow and yesterday. So there is an onus on, on science to, to put forward our best understanding at this stage to help you to make be, be, uh, good science-based policy. 
And likewise, farmers can't wait because the policy is shifting and farmers want to future-proof their businesses. So we had, uh, well, three examples um, of what's going on on, on farms. Uh, one was an example from the Dutch dairy industry, the approach that's been taken there by, both by, by the government and by industry to improve the sustainability on Dutch dairy farms. And I think there's a very uh, comprehensive system of, of measurement of what's going on in the farms and improvement, then you, you, using the, the information to help farmers to make improvements on their farms. Then we had two examples from, from pig production. Um, one from Switzerland and one from, from Poland mainly, but, but also uh, so, some involvement of that company in the Ukraine. At, at very different scales, one is a, um, a, a recent returnee to her, her family farm to, um, to take over the, the family's pig business, and they have established some fantastic innovations uh, around the... Um, the rearing of, of pigs, they, they've introduced a single, uh, um, uh, an intermittent suckling regime to help with the weaning process. They have some very, very good uh, housing systems. And the other big innovation, though, is around the feeding system and f introducing forage into the di diet of the pigs. And I think running a very successful business there. And at the other end of the scale, uh, we heard from, from Poland, uh, a business with, I think, if I remember rightly, 12,000 sows. Uh, a fully integrated business growing all their own feed, uh, processing that feed, uh, you know, f f fully integrated uh, farming systems then with um, the return of the, the manure, usually after having gone through a biogas plant to the, the land that's growing the feed. They have their own slaughtering facility and they're producing their own consumer products. And they have great data and use that all along the chain to measure their performance and have a very, um, I think, sustainable system and have been ahead of the regulations in terms of, of animal welfare and, and, and that for, for many years. And uh, so, you know, have put in place a, a very sustainable system, I think. And the point that I want to make about that is, you know, again, there's no one size fits all. We had two very different types of pig enterprises that are two, doing two very different sets of things on their farms, but both contributing to, uh, to improving their, their systems in, in their context. And th the last presentation was from uh, one of the vice presidents of CJA, who talked to us about the challenge of getting young farmers to enter uh, farming. And, um, you know, for any sustainable system, um, uh, generational renewal or new people coming into the industry is a really critical part of, of sustainability. So um, Katharina uh, identified things like access to land and financing um, for young farmers and financing the cost of the, the transition that we, we're going through as, as challenges that are bigger, you know, that, that are, I suppose, preventing uh, young farmers from being able to, to take up careers in farming. So, look, that's my summary of where we've got to today. And um, we now want, for the remainder of our time, to have a discussion around that uh, with you and, and with the speakers and, and the audience. And we have a lot of people online, so could I encourage people online to, to put your questions in, in the chat. Uh, but before we go to the discussion, we'll give each of you the floor for, for a few minutes to make some opening comments. So you can make them there for your seat. I think just speak closely into the microphone, if you don't mind, because uh, the sound for the people online is not good unless we, we speak close to the microphone. So you're very welcome, um, Wolfgang. Thank you very much, Frank. And uh, uh, hello to you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, sustainable life, livestock systems, what does this mean? Um, I'm often tempted to say that sustainable, the notion of sustainable is very easy to pronounce, but to define it is like nailing a pudding on the wall. I do not know who has tried it, but it is not easy. One thing is clear that sustainable livestock systems uh, are part of the discussion on, a sustainable, on sustainable food systems. And the first uh, remark I would like to make is we tend to uh, limit the notion of sustainability to climate, environment, biodiversity aspects. Yes, these are very important aspects of the sustainability, 
But I think there is broad agreement that when we are talking about sustainability, it's also about economic considerations, and it's also about social considerations. And sometimes we forget these elements when we are discussing about sustainability of food systems in general, including on livestock. So it's also about income for farmers, it's about lively rural areas, it's about animal welfare, it's about the conditions of workers. So, life, so sustainability in, in the broadest sense is really extremely comprehensive. But let me focus now on the uh, climate, environmental and biodiversity aspects of, uh, of livestock. If you look at the uh, European contribution to the worldwide greenhouse gas emissions, it's about 1%. And most of this 1% results from livestock emissions and partly from nitrates. So without any doubt, there is an issue when it comes to uh, greenhouse gas emissions and livestock, in particular with respect to cattle. Secondly, certainly we have an issue with environmental considerations, because livestock is uh, polluting soil, water, air. So we have an issue there in terms of, uh, of uh, sustainability, environmental sustainability. And yes, we have also issues with respect to animal welfare. So I think uh, livestock, sustainable livestock really requires that we carefully consider how we can make the livestock more sustainable in in, uh, in, eco in ecological terms. Now, how to go about this? Uh, firstly, I think uh, in the European Union now, you see that on the one hand, we try to regulate through the emissions directive, for example, through animal welfare legislation, but we also act through the common agricultural policy where through uh, eco-schemes and agro-environmental schemes, we try to uh, address uh, the uh, negative uh, consequences in terms of environment, climate, and uh, 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 biodiversity of livestock. And I think if you look at the national strategic plans for the next five years, we address many of these issues. I think what I personally find not satisfactory is that we are always talking about livestock, and I think you, Frank, have referred to the diverse situation of livestock across Europe. If you take a card of, of Europe and you put some, some elements in terms of environmental degradation uh, related to livestock stock on, this, on, this, on this map, you will see this is not everywhere. There are hotspots where water quality, where maybe methane emissions, other negative features are very prominent. And I think this is what we should have in mind when we want to address and improve the situation. We tend sometimes to say livestock sectors. So reduce livestock in Europe. I have received, when we started the discussion on the Sustainable Food System Framework Law, a contribution where a, a science research institute has said, your Article 1 should read, reduce livestock in Europe by 60%. But why should I reduce livestock, for example, in Austria? If I need all that cattle and all that uh, 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 livestock to maintain my landscape, my pastures, so I think we really have to focus on, on instruments, and be it in terms of incentives or be it, be it in terms of legislation, that uh, addresses livestock in areas where we are not within our planetary boundaries. When it comes to environment, when it comes to climate, when it comes to biodiversity. And this is, I think, what we should do. And Therefore, it is also hugely important that we have best practices, research, and guidance in this respect. You have addressed another issue which is related to this this morning. 
we see now a multitude of certifications of sustainability. And believe it or not, these certificates often are extremely divergent. There is a certification scheme, I do not uh, single it out. The result of which is, because they use the PEF methodology, that the most intensive farming is the greenest farming. And the most extensive livestock is red. But ask somebody out in the streets whether he finds this reasonable. And people will tell you, no, this is not sustainable. But it's evidence-based, as you have said. And then you have, on the other hand, certification systems who try to look at several elements, not only on greenhouse gas emissions, not only on health issues, which are important, but they also look on what is the consequence on rural areas? What about biodiversity? What about carbon sequestration? And I think this is something which we really need to take into consideration when we want to have a comprehensive and socially acceptable definition of what is sustainable livestock. I personally feel that sometimes we focus on one indicator, but life, unfortunately, is more complex than one indicator. And this is why I think it's hugely important that we also take into account the positive externalities of livestock farming. And I insist on this because I've seen it all my life, these positive effects. But this does not mean that we need to address the deficiencies and weaknesses which we have in certain places in Europe with respect to livestock, and not only with cattle, but also with, with pig and with, with, uh, with uh, poultry. I think a last point, which uh, comes to my mind when we are discussing this, uh, this uh, uh, question of sustainable livestock. And I do not want to be ideologic, because I think your message, Frank, was that both small and big farms can be sustainable. And I do not really uh, object to this. But the question I have sometimes is, is agriculture not related to territory? Should farmers not have feed? Should farmers not have the, the conditions to raise animals? At least this is what I have seen when I was young all my life. A farmer has land on which he keeps animals. And we have places now where there is no link anymore between feed and animal raising. And I think that is also a question which we should ask ourselves, whether, this is, whether these are business models which also in, 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 in times of, of climate change are uh, the right ones. So I do not want to... to to judge on this, but I just would like to raise this issue that sometimes I feel that uh, we have completely cut the relationship between land and, and, and farming, and this is something which we should look into more closely. Many thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Um, no, I, I won't you know, I think you, you said lots of things that we, we would very much agree with in Animal Task Force, like linking, um, linking animal production and, and f food feed production and animals and plants that link and so on. But so, so thank you for those, those comments. Humberto. Well, thank you very much for having me. I um, always enjoy engaging with the Animal Task Force because I do think these debates around livestock and environment are very crucial ones. But let me start a bit on the higher element of sustainability. I'm convinced that the big quest of the century for humankind is indeed the quest for sustainability. But what is this sustainability? Is it planetary sustainability? No, the planet doesn't need for us to, to take care of it. It has many millions of years to sort out whatever mess we can do. This is sustainability for humans. But there's one point of view we usually say of three pillars of sustainable development. I don't think pillars is a good word because it's actually three layers. 
as an, in a wedding cake. And indeed, the environment is the underlying layer, which doesn't mean it's the only one important, but it does mean that without a healthy environment, you cannot build a society and you cannot build an economy. Now, if you care a lot for the environment, uh, but put society in turmoil, you know, humans, when they, they feel, well, everyone is going to a party except me, I spoil the party for all. So these elements have taken into account emotions, equity, and et cetera, as, are as important as environmental sustainability to begin with. But I do think it's a very important point, and why are food systems, agriculture particularly, always involved in these discussions? Well, with my lenses of biodiversity, we know very well from science the main five drivers of loss, and it's first land use change, and sea use change also, then it's over-exploitation, climate change, pollution, invasive alien species. Of course, agriculture is not the cause, of every single of these drivers, but it's linked to every single of it, of it on land use, ne noticeably, etc. So uh, there's, of course, a lot of pressures around agriculture, including livestock and sustainability, some of which we used to see, call it the short term, the cost of fertilizers of energy, even before the war in Ukraine. But now we are having, and we usually looked at, let's say, climate change pressures or biodiversity loss pressures more in the long term, but I think they are coming closer to closer to short term also when you look to the floods we've seen every daily um, flooding, including agricultural area, etc. So let's say we need to tackle these things together. And noticeably, uh, in the current scenario where we do have a degradation of environment, natural resources, ecosystem services with an increasing population and the complex world as we see it, um, the transition to uh, sustainable food systems is fundamental, and it's not at all delinked from food security. We cannot talk food security if, as, as if it's only the short term, it's actually the longer term that also interests us. So with this said, livestock systems, or livestock in general, has been under siege. We have seen that uh, in the public debate, because it's climate change, it's animal welfare, it's uh, uh, diets and health and so forth. And this leads sometimes to very simplistic views. I, I've, I've, I've used it in another event, we were both together. Sometimes I've seen this climate reductionism. So cows emit methane, we need no cows, we should have no cows. And this is absolutely nonsensical, because first we need animals. We need animals to maintain healthy ecosystems. And then humans need to use animals. We cannot have humans in some places of the world without using animals. One could say, okay, but those ecosystem services are also provided by wild animals and semi-wild. Yes, for sure, but in many places of the world, what do we have? Livestock providing or potentially providing this service that animals do in ecosystems. So for sustainable livestock systems, I would say, keep some things in mind, which is, well, whatever they do, keep them within natural boundaries. So this link with the land seems to me very important. Taking into account the delivery of ecosystem services beyond the meat and dairy and meal uh, and, uh, or, or eggs. So we would need to conceive sustainable livestock systems as embedded in the wider ecosystem. Actually, I, I endorse very much this view of Wolfgang. A problem with agriculture, I believe, is that it went very much into separation. So monocultures, you just do one crop, you pump chemicals into it as need be, and you take everything out, uh, trees, it's animals, etc. We need to go back to farms as ecosystems themselves where trees, crops, animals work together because that helps for sure for sustainability. Now, to give you some more uh, quick thoughts, I do believe that uh, it's under the extensive grazing livestock that you can be closer to capturing these ecosystem services that really drive sustainability. For instance, um, a properly managed extensive systems of grazers, you can deal with weeds and pests and diseases for the other crops. You can enrich the soil, increase its fertility. You can increase biodiversity, stock carbon in the soil, maintain grassland, and even um, have some wildfire prevention, which is being more and more important nowadays. So this conceptually for extensive systems, is the easiest go. Now, it must be really extensive. Uh, I've seen some systems which are, let's say, intensive in open air. If you bring in too much inputs, 
the stock rate, etc., then you'll have the usual negative um, impacts of excess nutrient soil compaction, loss of soil biodiversity, and so forth. I do see it more difficult for mm, at least, well, I, let's say, the factory, factory farming systems or intensive livestock. They are, it's much more of a challenge to bring them to sustainability. I would be pleased to know how to do it. On extensive, I see the pathway. For intensive, I see it less clearly. And actually, um, the, the, most of the impacts of the livestock system are usually associated with intensive systems. And for this, don't count only on technological fixes to sort it out. Of course, we can and should address technology for housing, for feeding, for uh, store, um, manner storage, uh, how to to uh, field spread, uh, spreading that reduce emissions. All that is good to look into technology, but don't expect just the technology to sort it out. We need to have these ecological elements incorporated, in my view. Another thought is. I really don't think that we can pursue livestock sustainability. Having in mind, we'll have ever more animals and more meat growing, growing, growing. Why? Don't forget this figure. The biomass of mammals on Earth nowadays, it's 62% livestock, 32% humans, and 4% all the rest. So rhinos, elephants, whatever, that's on the 4%. We went really a bit too far. So I do think sustainability likely will require less animals overall, probably less meat consumption, but still quality meat consumption and meat that was done providing ecosystem services. Final thought, because I'm speaking more than I thought, is uh, livestock farmers. First, I think it, uh, uh, we have been very unfair as a society on the way we treat or look into livestock farmers. We should have more recognition of their role and respect for the identity and the cultural, traditional, and social importance of livestock farming. But I do believe also that they should evolve towards being seen and self-perceived as, yes, producing meat and dairy, etc., but delivering ecosystem services and being paid also by these ecosystem services. We need to count all externalities, the good and the bad ones. And when uh, the market is not ready to cover for these values, public money for public goods, payment for ecosystem services, that would certainly help. And I hope that some announced structural dialogue with the farming community can help discuss these issues. Sorry if I took too long, but voila. Okay. Thank you very much. Look, it's, it's again great to get your perspective as, as with Wolfgang. So, look, we have time now for questions and uh, comments and discussions. So, please raise your hand if you have a, a question. And our speakers in this morning, feel free to ask questions to Wolfgang and Umberto or make comments. We'll have an open discussion. And Anna Santos and Anna Granados will monitor the, the questions coming in from people online, and I will go to you. Um, for some questions in a few minutes. But uh, Lauren Smith, who is the coordinator of the Pathways Project, has the microphone first. Yeah, thanks. Is that working? Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks. So I had a question. Uh, it's actually directed for, to Hayo's presentation. Thank you for your talk earlier. It's just, um, there's been a lot of interest in social life cycle assessment, building on the guidelines from the United Nations Environment Programme, and also a lot of interest, as we've just heard, on... on um, environmental economics in terms of costing the externalities. I just wondered if you could comment on the value and also perhaps the drawbacks of those approaches in terms of addressing the limitations that you highlighted in your nature sustainability paper. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for that question. Um, when I started my talk, I, I wanted to point out that I was talking about environmental life cycle assessment, which is among the three branches of life cycle assessment, the one that's most advanced, and it's the one that I know about. I know that work is going on on social um, life cycle assessment and uh, economic life cycle assessment, but um, I think it's less advanced. It's very important, this work, but I'm not the right one to really tell you about where they are and uh, of, of course it's um, I mean I'm working on environmental life cycle assessment 
it's important because it's a multi-criteria approach, but it's only uh, the environmental side, and I agree that the other pillars of the sustainability are very important too, but I can't comment too much on where we are on the life cycle assessment side for this. Okay, so Jean-Louis wants to make a comment and then we will go to the audience again. Yes, um, <coughs> the, the problem is that uh, sustainability of livestock is a very broad issue and uh, you said that we need to consider livestock as a part of an ecosystem. This is a, and we don't do that in research. We consider dairy production in one side, pig production in another, poultry production in another, and so on. So we don't consider ecosystem, and it is a, it is a problem. And at the end, we have method. We don't consider ecosystem. You said we have three family of uh, life cycle analysis, environmental, social, economic. And even in environmental, we have only few points. We have no so much indicators for biodiversity, for example. But we are very, very precise for greenhouse gas e emission. And finally, what the research provide to the society is a very negative aspect of the livestock sector. Probably this negative aspect is, is part of the truth, it's clear, uh, but it is not the, the system in total. And we, it is ur urgent that we develop more holistic approach <coughs> of the system and pathway, uh, step up, I think are good tools or good project to, to achieve this because we have a, a partial view of the evaluation of sustainability of the livestock sector. And if we consider that livestock is part of an ecosystem, we can admit that, okay, dairy cows or beef cows or sheep produce some methane, but it is not a problem in itself if they provide a lot of services to the society and to the ecosystem. Okay, thank you, Jean-Louis. So please, I may ask you just keep your comments brief because we have lots of questions. So Harold, do you want to make a comment? Could I ask you to keep it short yes. and succinct? I think it's very important to realize that sustainability is a systems property. And so it means when you, have, and this we also do in, in industry, we don't look at sustainable bolts and sustainable uh, nails and sustainable hammers. It doesn't exist. Is the production facility we have sustainable or not? If it is, if yes, there are three sieves it needs to go through. The natural sustainability, so the mass flows and biodiversity in these, needs to go through the economic one, and it needs to go through the social ones. The solutions that don't pass these three sieves are not sustainable, period. And it's systems property. So when a system is sustainable, all the products that come out of it is per definition sustainable, regardless what they are because the definition hangs on the system. And this we need to get into our approach here. I would like to challenge right up some of the basic assumptions that we make here, also us sitting here today, which aren't true. We're assuming that livestock is damaging to the environment. Now, that we fell straight into the, the, the trap I just said we shouldn't fall into. We're looking at the output from a system, so we're trying to address the output instead of the system itself. So now we need to stop and get back to the system. That's what we need to make sustainable. And then we have to also bring in, if I have sustainability costs coming up here and sustainability benefits here somewhere else, sometimes far away, they need to be brought together. We do that, then we have proper methods. If our methods don't capture it, well, the methods aren't good enough. So we need to improve a lot. So actually, at the very outset, some of the questions we ask, we need to rethink them. Okay, can I maybe move on then? And, and I fully agree with what you're saying. The problem is policymakers have problems to deal with. We have <laughs> climate change now, we have water quality now, we have biodiversity loss now, and policymakers can't wait until we get the perfect system of evaluating our systems to give them the right answer. So that's, that's the challenge for us. You know, we're, we're working with imperfect information, but we've got to make the best decisions we can based on the information we do know. But we're not gonna give the blame for climate change on the farmers. I mean, I come from an oil nation. They laugh all the way to the bank and they're very happy when, when that rhetoric is coming through. And it isn't real. It's, not, it's reality detached. We need to deal with that. 
Yeah, uh, open goal for you, Harold. Uh, we, I mean, we heard the, the term holistic approach, and of course, I don't know what should we include in the methods when we address that term, holistic, I and mean, several of people. I mean, we have system analysis, and of course, Harald has that definition clear. Uh, and is there a difference between a holistic approach and a system anal analysis approach? Anybody want to try have a go at answering that? <coughs> um, I can. It's so systems analysis is the tool you use to try th to find holistic systems, you know, to get everything in. So it's the method you use with mapping that up. So yes, we need to use that. Okay. Questions? Um, well, first beside you there, so save time. Marion? Yeah, this is Marion from the Wageningen University. Um, so uh, what, what we see in the Netherlands is that actually uh, uh, greenhouse, so farmers are being rewarded nowadays for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I talked about uh, dairy farming in the Netherlands and there's uh, from the industry there's a uh, rewarding with regard uh, to, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but there's also some rewarding for, uh, let's say, ecosystem services or biodiversity contributions, but that's less. So the, the biggest stimulant nowadays is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So they are uh, rewarded uh, per gram of uh, CO2 equivalent reduced, uh, let's say. And that is uh, pushing the systems or rewarding, especially towards more intensification. So it's it's uh, stimulating towards a certain system to increase your productivity because uh, and and to uh, improve your efficiency so i was wondering especially for uh, humberto and um, wolfgang to uh, to comment on that how do how do you see that that uh, that actually have we have many environmental issues uh, but it seems as um, for climate especially because it's expressed per kilogram of product also that is an, uh, a specific issue um, that you see that uh, the currently um, greenhouse gas emissions are up front uh, in terms of uh, uh, steering uh, systems in, t in a certain direction. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I'm a bit afraid of that. Uh, and also farmers, I hear dairy farmers saying, well, they want us to go in this direction because it's uh, for reducing <coughs> greenhouse gas emissions. But how about biodiversity? How about uh, hey, more extensive uh, systems uh, that are actually not uh, being uh, rewarded for what they do. Frank. Okay, thank you. I'm pleased to start. Uh, well, there are good reasons to understand Frank, why. Just, Umberto, just Sorry, a yep. second, if you don't mind. We have a question that is very similar in the chat. So I want to just address that. Uh, uh, how can be this question uh, from Marion? Marion Manon? Which is, I don't remember now. Marion, right. It can be favored through policy measures. So it's a follow-up of, of our question. So if you can go further on how policy can uh, help on this, that will be great. Thank you. Okay. So what I was saying, there are good reasons to understand why climate has uh, taken more attention. One is because, let's say, climate impacts are rather visible. Sometimes other impacts of non-climate environmental problems can become a bit less visible. And second, it's much easier to measure CO2 than ecosystem services, for instance. But, uh, so, but now, normally, a good climate policy will also bring benefits for the rest of the environment, biodiversity included, because both things are very closely linked, much more than we think. We cannot sort out the climate puzzle without nature. But on this issue of having a more complete picture, well, in the Netherlands, it's not just about greenhouse gas emissions or biodiversity. The nitrogen crisis, for instance, was triggered because of impacts on protected habitats. So the link is out there. And nowadays there are plans, uh, as far as I remember, from the Dutch government to also put money on the table for nitrogen-related issues. So what I say is we need to evolve and we cannot be climate reductionists. Climate is still very important and still at the center. But if we capture the whole spectrum through system, a system approach, an holistic approach of what's at stake around livestock and its ecosystem services and impacts, we will get this integrated policy that we need. These are my comments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the question. And 
I think you, you replicate my concerns, in fact, because if you just focus on one indicator and one objective, as important as it is, as, as, as Umberto has pointed out, you might oversee the positive externalities of, of, uh, of uh, in our case of livestock, in, in, in other respects. And I think now we have made a judgment as a societies and uh, on, on governance levels that climate change is such an important issue that we have to put all our efforts in, 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 in that direction. And the consequence is that uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction is, is, if you want, the command number one for, for everybody. But I'm afraid, as you, that this overseas, that our society also requires uh, uh, other uh, 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 eco-services. And, and uh, mm -hmm. I think what we try still in, in the common agricultural policy, we still provide incentives also for uh, for more extensive farming. But if you just uh, uh, permit me a personal remark, I was recently in New Zealand and uh, I was so impressed because every farm you have visited, the first thing they gave me, whether it were young farmers or old farmers, was their methane certificate. I mean, if I look at my neighbors in Austria, they might even, who are farmers, they might even not be aware that they have methane emissions. This is the number one, and I ask this person, but I mean, you are a farmer. You are producing food. You should be proud that you are producing food. Why don't you tell me that you are producing food? Why is your first thing that comes to, to your mind when you have a visitor is to show your methane uh, <laughs> balance? And I think that, that, that shows how, in terms of policy making, we have succeeded, at least in certain parts of the world, uh, to, 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 to make people aware of what, what is, is at stake. But I said to him, because he was very proud that uh, he was on this farm since 1856, and it was always the same family. And I said, what would your grand, 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 grandfather think if you see you now showing me your methane certificate. Because he was a farmer, he was producing sheep, meat, and whatever. That is what he was proud of. Now you are proud of showing me your methane certificate. This is what happens. That's a really good comment. I'm going to go here for our next question. Uh, Gregor, who's our, our, um, one of our speakers this morning, runs a, a very big pig, integrated pig uh, operation, mainly in Poland. Yeah, I, I love very much your comments, uh, Wolfgang, exactly. We, 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 we talk about huge complexity and your, uh, your comparison to this pudding thing is very, uh, very good here. Exactly, when we, uh, when we uh, communicate methane and carbon footprint to consumers, they don't understand. So we need a more simple, understandable language. Uh, but we don't have time to speculate too long about these things. We all feel more or less uh, what sustainability is about, uh, but we should not try I think, to work out a perfect system. We, we need to introduce and implement things here and now because climate change is happening today. The environment is deteriorating today. So let's work uh, out and support the simple solutions which are known and maybe delegate uh, the details to the single countries because, again, back to the discussion about site-specific context, uh, which would be different from place to place. And the holistic view all the way through. That's my idea and my urge and my call then let's make it simple, quick, let's secure necessary finance, financing and communication to the stakeholders, including the transition, spirit, transition periods which are sustainable, but yeah, adjusted to the needs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll take that as a comment. There's a question um, over here in the back and then a question over on the other side. Thank you, I'm Justin Zara from uh, today, Environmental Defense Fund Europe. We are a climate NGO. Uh, that works with farmers to try to bring them the resources and particularly the financing to secure their livelihoods and uh, be able to make the transition. And my question is, I guess, uh, for Wolfgang, because I spent most of my life in a paying agency or running the agriculture department in my country, so I remember him when we were trying to check whether the money that we were paying uh, from the common agriculture policy was being used for the right reasons 
back at a time when we had about 12 million farmers in the EU. Today we have 9 million farmers and I think everyone understands what the drivers of this are. There are uh, a consolidation trend that is seeing the farms that are able to really uh, have more comprehensive solutions that put the tech there that are more able to find the financing and the challenges. And I think that you know the work that we do nowadays in some member states, uh, what we are getting asked by farmers is how do I finance the transition that I need to do? Because this is over and above what I am already hurting from. And when we think of the aid that we can give through the strategic plans, for instance, we see that there is quite a lot of investment. And when they go to the banks and they knock on the door, the bank looks at the business plan, but no one is really looking at what kind of operational aid they need to make the jump. So if I had to put it very simply, uh, Marion talked about the uh, trial that Friesland Campina is doing in the Netherlands to feed three NOP, which is the feed additive that reduces methane by about 28% or so uh, over the first two years. It's a really important thing, I think, because you have the option of having this gas, which is 80 times more powerful in the first 20 years than CO2 in terms of warming, that can really be cut down by an enormous percentage simply by using this feed additive. But the additive costs money. And although the company that produces it has just hit the 100,000 uh, farm mark in terms of trials, there is only one farmer in the world right now who is actually feeding this from his own pockets. Otherwise, uh, if you talk about the farmers who are in the different trials, they all wonder and are trying to work out in the balance sheet how they go on financing that. So I guess my question is this, how do we really now that we also see companies and actors in the value chain trying to come because they have this problem with the scope three emissions, right? So they know that in a year or so, they also need now to start accounting for their suppliers, which have been, I will say it very frankly, largely ignored by them for a lot of the time because they said, okay, there is the cap money and farmers can just find the solutions there. How do we bring those together and use the cap money to try, or maybe not the cap money, but other public financing to really find the, the right balance of public and private financing for those solutions, knowing that they are at hand? Thank you, a really good question. And we have another question over here, Susanna. So, Wolfgang, I think that was addressed towards you. Thank you very much for this question. And uh, <clears throat> let me start with a, with a side remark because you have referred to. I find it in increasingly interesting that we often think that we as, as uh, public authorities are creating the frame for uh, the future of farming. But what I realize increasingly is that, uh, that the processors and the retailers are much more are increasingly important in setting the frame for agricultural activities. Yesterday we had a meeting uh, in, in a panel discussion on food systems where, the, where colleagues of Mondelez were present. I had similar discussions with Nestle, similar discussions with Arla. Uh, these uh, uh, processors are hugely important in setting the rules for those farmers who are providing their uh, products to these farmers. They set environmental conditions. They pay, hopefully, also fair prices for these additional efforts. What I want to say is that, that things are happening there. Sometimes, I think also, if you ask, because we are discussing these days about the food chain, and everybody says, yeah, we need the food systems, not anymore agriculture, but food systems. But still, we need to be prudent in, in if we are around now in food systems, that not everybody has a good idea, which is to say, and the farmer shall. Because that's a little bit the temptation. Now everybody's around the table, but instead of looking at what he could do, they're all telling the farmers what they sh still should do. But on your second question, and, and the example that you have raised, uh, how, for example, uh, uh, ensure the financing of the transition. Firstly, I really think that uh, if you look now at the common, the common agriculture policy, we have about 100 billion for this, uh, whatever, five years, just for agri-environmental and eco-ski measures, which really should provide the farmers incentives and support for becoming more sustainable. But exactly on the point that you are raising, and I have discussed it at many occasions with, with, with Frank, what shall we do now with respect to livestock? 
and reducing methane emissions as, as a part of the, of the, of the transition. And uh, firstly, uh, not many national strategic plans are very talkative about this question, but those who have good intentions and would like to give some feed additives to ensure that uh, greenhouse gas emissions are reduced, they, are, they ask for support, financial support for, because this is, this is uh, relatively costly. And we are ready to, to provide this support because evidently we have an interest that the methane emissions are reduced. But then we are suddenly blocked by uh, considerations, believe it or not, of WTO compatibility. Because we are not supposed to pay payments per animal. But how do you want to pay a, a, a contribution to a farmer who reduces his greenhouse gas emissions? Different, you cannot put it on his land. I, we try it now to put this obligation somewhere uh, on the land so that we, that we still can reimburse the uh, a kind of payment that is land-based and not animal-based. But uh, I think we, we, we still rely on, 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 on public support for the transition. But what I want to say is that I really see the, the processes and re retailers also coming in and, and hoping that they will uh, correctly, uh, proportionally reimburse farmers <laughs> for their additional efforts. Okay, thank you. Question over here. Thank you. So my name is Lina Jensen and I work for the gelatin uh, European industry. <clears throat> so I have also, uh, I would like to take, to ask you if you have not forgotten all the byproduct industries linked to the livestock industry. Mm -hmm. um, they, are, they, are, they are part of the whole circular economy system and food system and bring a lot of benefits also to the society. Uh, gelatin, for example, is used in uh, capsules and uh, a key product also for our society. And um, I just want to be sure, because we don't hear so much about the byproducts industry, that you don't forget us. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I think <coughs> uh, if you look uh, 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 at the discussion over the last years, when we discussed food security, uh, there were two main criticisms uh, about uh, livestock. Firstly, that we import too much feed from abroad with all the related uh, deforestation issues and these kind of things. And the second complaint which we have received was always that I have heard figures that people said 80% of your agricultural land is used to feed animals. And I find this hugely uh, unobjective because we have about 150 million hectares of land, out of which already 50 million hectares is grassland. So what shall I do with this grassland if not feeding animals? And then evidently we have also arable land and the assumption is that on arable land, you can exclusively produce uh, food and not feed. And I think, uh, as far as I understand, this is not really the case. So you have uh, byproducts from arable crops production, but even arable crops production, which does not qualify for uh, human consumption. And there again, the use of is in, in, in the logic of a circular economy for, for feedstuff, I think is the right thing to do. What we still look into, and I think our commissioner has announced it for the beginning of next year, is we are looking at a, a protein strategy for Europe, which will really look at, 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 at what <coughs> do we do with our uh, agricultural land in Europe and how can we best use it. And uh, I think in that, uh, uh, respect also your your industry plays an important role. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So there's lots of questions, but we're running out of time. So I'm going to take three questions together. One from Katerina, who's the vice president of CJA, and then we'll come over here to Michael Lee, and then Anna Santos has a question from the online audience. So we'll take the three questions first, and then we'll deal with the answers as efficiently as possible. Katerina. 
Um, thank you. So, um, Vice President of CESA, European Young Farmers. Um, so, we have seen we're already at this transition of sustainable farming um, because we farmers already need to look forward, they need to adapt. Um, so, we talk about animal welfare, we talk about um, animal transportation, um, but also terms that are not very much defined, such as regenerative agriculture comes up, so it's a um, big mix. And we can estimate where the path is going, um, but still it is not very clear. So also in the news, we often read that um, contracts have been cancelled um, between retailers and farmers. Um, still the farmers have already invested, um, have a long-term investment running, have a production system they are attached to. Um, so to keep it short, my question uh, would be how can we guarantee uh, long-term certainty for young people that are investing in the sector or also for people that are um, yet wanting to um, change their system. How can we look forward for the next 30, 40 years, in especially when we are in a transition? Okay, thank you. So that's question one. If you can bring the microphone to Michael. Or it's okay. <laughs> Hi, um, Michael Lee from Harper Adams University in the UK. I'm also president of the Livestock Farming Systems Commission of the European Federation of Animal Science. Um, talking about the systems level, I think it's, it's great that we better understand sustainability at the systems level. I think that's critically important. But we love histograms, and we like to break out things into different quarters or uh, components, and we always put agricultural uh, emissions and climate change impact in one, and then energy and transportation and another. And critically, we need to look at the interaction between these. Because I think we'll all agree that we're moving to a world without fossil fuels. And when we realize that world, are we going to give a damn about burping cows? I think the answer to that is no, we're not. And so we've got to be very careful that we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater when we're realizing that journey towards a more sustainability. And that's, of course, not saying that we can't look at improvements in agriculture, but we need to look at the metrics critically and understand as well the lack of understanding we have in pollutants in the atmosphere, a real lack of understanding um, about the sinks of methane in the atmosphere. We've just had an FAO report talking about um, methane sinks, one of the authors next to me, and it's a great report, David, but, of course, one of the biggest issues with that report is a major gap associated with atmospheric sinks and a lack of understanding. And we are now clearly about the, the impact of fossil fuels, carbon, hydroxy radicals. We need to start to find metrics around biogenic carbon recycling emissions and fossil carbon new carbon that's been released into the atmosphere and how they look and interact between sectors, not just agriculture, but all these. Let's be very careful about that baby in the bath. Okay, we'll take that as a comment that should be addressed. So, yeah. yes, <clears throat> okay, no, okay, and Anna? Yeah, how to include broad sustainability and externalities into consumer decision making to ensure them to actually buy more sustainable animal products. This is a difficult one. Okay, we touched maybe on that with Claire earlier on, on labeling, but anybody want to pick up on first one about providing long-term certainty for young farmers um, and second one around new metrics being needed and that's very much close to the methane brief of the Animal Task Force and the last one about consumers and giving, bringing consumers into the decision making process. So, Maybe just on, on, on the first question. <clears throat> I'm optimistic in the sense that uh, we will need food also in the future and agriculture and farmers and young farmers play a huge role in this in this uh, in this context what i think we still need to to further improve and i think the many crises which we have recently seen uh, asks for this which has led to discussions on food affordability is that we really look uh, uh, in, into the interaction between the different levels of the food chain. The farmers, 
the processors, the retailers, the consumers. There is a big discussion now uh, who is losing and gaining money in this process because the inflation is very high, partly 20%. And now everybody looks at each other, uh, who's, who, 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 whose fault is it? Who has got the money? Is it the farmer? Is it the retailer? Is it the processor? So I think we need to look into this. And one element in, in this context is the unfair trading practices. You know we have adopted legislation in that respect, and which gives farmers a certain guarantee, maybe not enough yet. And this is why I think this is an important element uh, in which we, which we have to look at, in which we have to, which we have to consider. As regards the, the role of the, of the consumers, I will not tell you a lot of new things. You know all these things. There is on the one hand, if you ask somebody whether he is ready to, uh, to buy uh, green uh, or sustainable food, they are, they are saying yes when it comes to the shop and to the prices. <laughs> The envy to buy this uh, food is, is less uh, is less uh, present, and we see now, with respect to organic production, at least in parts of Europe, that the demand in in terms of food affordability have increased. So I think still we need to do a lot in in terms of promotion and information of what is about sustainable food. We are facing in agriculture now this discussion. I mean, the question is. Should we still provide information on meat, or should we stop to provide promotion and information on meat? So some say, don't do it anymore, because this is harmful for uh, human health. Others argue, and we argue, but people will continue to eat meat. Why should we not promote sustainable meat? meat from organic farming, meat that meets uh, certain sustainability criteria. And here again you see this, this, uh, this polarization of discussions, in fact. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's still important to provide uh, relevant information. Umberto. Uh, well, being on the same topics, uh, I do follow environmental policy for quite some time now. And um, in the sense, what would a young farmer expect for the future? I'll tell you, it comes in cycles. So more attention to environment, less attention, more attention, less attention. But it doesn't go this way. It goes this way. It goes up. Why? Because the overall situation is bad. So to put it a bit cynical, <laughs> when uh, we have bad news for the environment, that's normally good news for the development of our mental policy. So, so in a nutshell, this won't go away. This pressure towards going sustainable won't go away because we badly need it. Uh, we have not come with the sustainable food systems legislation in this, uh, in this uh, college, and I don't know what will happen in the future, but I would expect this sustainable food policy overall, of which agriculture is a part, but not the only player, will remain relevant. Uh, now, in terms of, let's say, all this chain of farm producers to processors, retailers, consumers, I, I agree with Wolfgang that some retailers and processors are doing quite some interesting uh, stuff on this, on requesting, yes, they do request their farmers to go this way or the other, but often with money in the, on the table. I was very impressed recently by, by an example of the CEO of Ili Cafe, they are doing worldwide with their producers. It sounded very in the good direction. Some probably are just trying to extract more money for them. But they say, how can we ensure that consumers play the game? Well, we can't ensure. There are several elements. One is awareness, and I think that should remain. Notably, many Europeans do perceive, they want, they desire naturalness in their food, whatever that means. Uh, it can mean different things for different people. But, um, so that's an element, but the main element, I often have this discussion uh, when we discuss environment, is there's something much more powerful than awareness, which is uh, money, cost. So, you know, because humans do react very well to pain and pleasure, we can certainly not go and provoke pain to those that misbehave or pleasure to the others, but money is a token for that, money in the pocket. Now, how can, let's say, we regulate that? Well, taxes. There are many ways to try to put more cost in the wrong practice. This does require having the, all the externalities evaluated, quantified, also all the benefits and uses, 
but that's a, a big a big tool that we don't have in the Commission anyway, but I think will be more important in the future. Okay, listen, we'll, I think, come to wrap up. What I'm going to do uh, in a minute is I'm going to give each of our three um, speakers uh, 20 to 30 seconds to make their key point that they would like to make from this morning, so very quick comment. Um, Umberto and Wolfgang, if you would like to make any closing comment, we'll give you a little longer, seeing as you're very important people. If you have any closing comments you'd like to make. And um, uh, Michael, we didn't really get to address your comment on the metrics, but I think the metric and how we assess methane and the appropriate target for methane, which is the, the subject of the policy brief we, we published um, uh, last July, I think is a question that is not, not going away. And, um, uh, will have to be addressed uh, at some stage in, in our climate uh, policy. But maybe starting with you, Heo, any, what would be your last takeaway soundbite that you'd like to give uh, the audience here today? Well, I'll, I'll be very brief. Uh, I was happy to hear what uh, these two very important persons said. It gives some hope for the future. <laughs> but uh, well, basically for me, I think LCA is a useful tool which is not perfect, which needs to be improved and which needs to be complemented with other tools to Very good. sustainability. Harold? Um, yeah, let's get our system boundaries set right. Let's put the boundaries in such a way that it matters. I have a challenge. Nordic agriculture sequesters 250 million tons of carbon dioxide every year. Nordic agriculture emits less than 100 million tons every year. Are we carbon sustainable? Are the farmers getting the reward for that? I don't see it now. I think we do need to introduce an argument around this. We're now arguing on the opponent's premises. Mm. Let's change it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we also need to up the spectrum, up the perspective. We're looking at just primary prediction. We need to look at primary production, supply chain, <coughs> economic structure of this supply chain and where the money really goes. Let's go top down and follow the money. I think that's going to give us some insights which will change our view on a lot of things. Okay, thank you. Jean-Louis? Um, concerning livestock sustainability, we need to think about the role of livestock, global role of livestock in ecosystem. I think it's very, very important. So we need to think per, per hectare to some extent and to see all the service of livestock. But in the same time, we also need to think about per kg of product because livestock is at the crossroad of ecosystem services and food production. Food is part of the an ecosystem, to be, to be honest. But, and uh, we need a, a well-balanced diet. So it's very important. And uh, what is the role of livestock within? If we reduce, for example, the consumption of red meat, it will be good for greenhouse gas emission. Of, uh, there is a lot of paper on this. But in the same time, we will reduce biodiversity because less ruminant, less grassland, so uh, less carbon storage prob probably. So, so it's a complex issue. We need to think in the, in the two dimension. And the last point is because uh, Wolfgang uh, speak about uh, protein plant at European level. If we have a shift of, of diet to mo slightly more protein-based plant, protein and plant protein and less animal, it will be a very, very small change in agriculture because our stomach has very small. If we need really a change and produce much more legumes for agronomical point of view, we need animals because animals are able to eat a huge amount of protein of plant origin, both forages and grain, and it will be good for the protein autonomy of the livestock sector because less soy import. Very good, thank you. <coughs> Umberto? I, I can have a couple of, of quick thoughts. We are in a moment right now which is very polarized, including discussions of agriculture versus environment. We have noticed around nature restoration law, how it has become with the sustainable use of pesticides regulation so controversial. And that comes sometimes from a misperception of the meaning of words. For instance, I've heard so it's such extraordinary claims as I do have more fish or we have more nature. I do have more food or we have more nature. And for someone that follows, let's say, nature as ecosystem, it makes no sense whatsoever because food in itself is an ecosystem service derived by, from nature, mediated by farmers. So I do think there's a, a, 
a huge matter of hope because whenever I speak with farmers or environmentalists, we don't usually diverge on the need to change. There may be divergence on the scale of the change and especially on the rhythm of the, the change and the support for transition. But I've concluded the following. We don't need to have the same worldviews to reach convergence on some issues. So now I'm very committed to try to find the ways on bridging this gap and showing, for instance, that some uh, ecosystem services provided by extensive livestock if properly managed amount to nature restoration from reducing a pressure, putting more biodiversity in soil and so forth. So we need to approach the, the concepts, the words, um, the meaning of words, and also the convergence that we can have all together. Okay, thank you. And Wolfgang, the last word. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I'm convinced that uh, livestock, for all the reasons which we have discussed today, continues to play uh, an important role also in the future. Evidently, we need to look at uh, issues like uh, human health. We need to look at the environmental uh, climate biodiversity damage, and we have tried to reduce uh, to the extent possible these uh, consequences. Uh, on the other hand, I think, and this discussion today has uh, really shown it, there are no simple solutions. And uh, Umberto has referred to the climate reductionism. Uh, there are no simple solutions. Things are interlinked and complex, and <coughs> the public debate does not often reflect, does not always reflect uh, this complexity. And I think you have raised this point, and I think you are, you are very right. We are always discussing on the arguments of our opponents, mm. instead of advancing uh, the, the, the external uh, benefits and the uh, positive effects of, of, uh, of farming in general, but also of livestock farming. And I think that is a feature which we, we should change, but uh, who is our ambassador, in fact? We? I'm not sure that I have the same scope than Greta Thunberg and Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> well, we have okay. to do the job ourselves. Yeah. Uh, there's no other choice. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you very much for that, all of you. So look, it just remains for me on your behalf to thank our, uh, all our speakers this morning, the, the people on the panel here, but also the, the others in the audience who presented here today. I think you helped to make this a really um, interesting seminar on sustainability and what does it mean in the context of livestock systems and how do we go about assessing it. So look, the, the debate will continue. Uh, the science will continue and Animal Task Force will continue to hopefully um, offer opportunities like this for engagement between policymakers and scientists and practitioners. So there is a little bit of lunch outside because we all need some, as you mentioned, uh, health and uh, nutrition. We need a little bit of that coming up now. So, Oh, it's downstairs, is it? Okay. So downstairs for, for the food. So look, thank you very much to all the people online, all the people here in the audience, and all my colleagues uh, helped to organize this. And a particular mention to Susanna de Magdale and Lauren Journe, uh, who um, underpinned the, the Animal Task Force effort. So go to Mila Mahagwid, which is a little bit of Irish. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you coming.